Uh, good evening, ladies, gentlemen, dear students also. Hartelijk welkom iedereen. Um, welcome at this, uh, this evening. It's my pleasure to see the room so filled and with people uh, with lots of interest for this, this subject. Um, my name is Eric Faber and on behalf of also uh, the organizational team of the Week of Inspiration and on behalf of the speaker, I, uh, it's a warm welcome to this evening. Um, Mr. Uh, Ignaz Snellen, the speaker of tonight, is full professor in uh, observational astrophysics at the University of Leiden and the scientific director of Leiden Observatory. Um, he has obtained some noticeable grants and prizes over the years, uh, of which one of the most recent is the, the 2022 uh, Spinoza Prize, which is also uh, named the Dutch Nobel Prize. Um, his research focuses on extrasolar planets, which means those are planets or worlds orbiting other, other suns than the one that we know. And uh, while the distances are enormous and the planets themselves are very tiny, uh, his group manages and is actually excellent in studying these objects and finding also very interesting detailed features of these, uh, these planets, such as uh, the climate and the atmospheres. These techniques are mostly deployed uh, for ground-based telescopes on Earth, such as uh, the extremely large telescopes, the ones that are there and that will be built in the near future. His group is uh, really operating at the cutting edge of our understanding of these fascinating worlds and also at the cutting edge of what is technically feasible and possible and uh, in an understanding what is here. Long-term goals are to understand how planets form, how common actually our own solar system is and to find out whether other life-bearing planets like the beautiful one on which we stand and live, our Earth, if there are companion planets like this. The hope is that all these worlds far, far away will teach us something also about ourselves. How common is life and in the universe? Uh, um, so far, my words, uh, Professor Snellen, we're ready for you to bring us into space. And the floor is yours. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Very nice to, uh, to actually uh, be here uh, and see you all. Yeah, I'm going to talk about extrasolar planets. So, um, in the early 1990s, uh, for you that's maybe a, lo a long time ago. For, for me, when you're a bit older, you think 1990s, I was, you know, that's not so, not so long. Um, the only planets that we knew were the ones in our own solar system. And then the first extrasolar planets, so the first planets around other stars were found. And we know now of thousands of them, and some of them, in many aspects, maybe look, look like Earth. And then you can ask the question, okay, if they have the size, they maybe have the climate of Earth, could life actually exist? And how could we actually find out? Well, this is the sort of journey I want to take with you in the, in the next hour and explain as much as possible about the universe on the way. Um, first things first, I just assume that you don't know much about the universe, so uh, I'll give you a, 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 a very quick uh, course. And we start with the, uh, with the smallest, uh, the smallest uh, sizes, and that's of course uh, the, the, the nearby universe, and that is the solar system. And uh, yeah, we, see, uh, uh, we see the sun here, and we see in the nearest to the sun are the rocky planets. We have Mercury, Venus, the Earth, and Mars. And just to get you a sense of scale, the Earth is about 100 times smaller than our Sun. And then, uh, so, so these, these planets are mainly built up of, of rock. And then further out, we have the gas giant planets. We have uh, Jupiter, which is about 10 times bigger than the Earth. Uh, we have Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And then nowadays Pluto, uh, which is actually officially a dwarf planet. So what is very nice about this picture, this really shows the relative sizes so Jupiter is 10 times bigger than the Earth, and the Sun 10 times bigger than Jupiter. What is completely wrong here are, of course, the distances. And already within our solar system, the distances are enormous. If you would take the Sun and you would squeeze it to, say, a football size, I know you're not football fans because this evening it's uh, Inter against AC uh, Milan. Uh, if you have the Sun, which is about a football size, 
The Earth is 100 times smaller, so it's like a, a, little, a little beat. It's about a, a, a 10, 10 meters distance. So and at 10 meters distance, it takes about 365 days to orbit this football. And then we have Jupiter. Jupiter is, uh, is about a ping pong uh, ball, and that ping pong ball is 10 times further, sorry, five times further away, so it's at about 50 meters and goes in about 11 years around the sun. So already at these very small scales, the universe space is very empty. You know, that there, there is not much uh, to, actually, uh, to actually see. Now, now we make a big jump to the larger scales, and then it turns out that uh, our sun is a normal star, and it's, it, it's part of our Milky Way. And the Milky Way is kind of an island of stars, of 100 billion of stars, and it, it's like a flattened disk. It's like a flattened disk, and we are somewhere on the outskirts, and we travel in about 200 million years, we make one circle around the center of the Milky Way. Now, there's also a lot of gas and dust, and because we are part of the Milky Way, and we are, uh, of course, in this disk, when we see the Milky Way, yeah, we see it from the, from the actual side, and therefore, when you look up in, in the actual sky, from, from, from Holland, it's a bit difficult to actually see, but if you go in the summer to southern, uh, southern Europe, and it's clear skies, it's nice dark, then you can see the Milky Way very well, and it is this band of light, uh, there's some dark patches, and that's because of dust, nearby dust, which obscures the more distant stars. And this glow is from the billions of stars which make up our sort of island, our own island of the Milky Way. Now, about 100 years ago, it was still not clear whether this was the universe. Is the Milky Way the universe, or is there something outside the Milky Way? There were these little smudges where it was not clear whether these nebulae were actually part of, of our own Milky Way or whether these were other islands, other Milky Ways, other galaxies, as we call them. And since Edwin Hubble in 1920, we know because they, he actually identified for the first time individual stars in these smudges, and it turns out, no, no, these are distant galaxies, other Milky Ways. And this is our nearest, our nearest neighbor. This is the so-called Andromeda galaxy, because of course we could never make a picture of, of our own uh, Milky Way system in this way. Now, and then of course it turns out that, that the universe is much bigger uh, than our own Milky Way. And if we now we fast forward, uh, this is a picture taken with the Hubble Space Telescope, and this is a part of the sky which is about the size of the full moon, and you see thousands of little smudges. These are all these islands, these are all galaxies, all islands in itself. Um, and it turns out in the visible universe there are billions of them. So we have billions of islands, billions of galaxies, each having hundreds, hundreds of billions of stars. So if you multiply these two, then you get a one with uh, 20, uh, 20, 20 zeros or so. And uh, you can ask yourself, yeah, what do we know about these other stars? Do they have planets? Do they have other Earth? Could life actually exist uh, on these planets? So this is the kind of journey that we want to, want to actually make and find out. Now, the first thing what we can do is, can we, can we just argue about this, right? Uh, we don't have to observe anything. We can just, when we think really hard, could we understand whether uh, life uh, uh, in the universe, you know, is the, is the Earth unique or are there other places like Earth? A little bit of philosophy. Well, there's one principle, a, philosoph uh, a philosophical principle, which for astronomers is very important, and that is the Copernican principle. And that really uh, started in the 15th, 16th century when we found out that the Earth is not the center of the universe. The Earth uh, rotates, orbits around the Sun, there are other planets orbiting around the Sun. The Sun is a very normal star, in the outskirts of our own galaxy, there's nothing special about the Milky Way. So in that sense, you know, you can say we do not observe the universe from a special location. The Earth is an ordinary planet. We are at an ordinary space. So if you, if you follow that principle, then you would think life should be everywhere. You know, everywhere we look in the universe, there should be planets like Earth and life should actually exist. But there's another important principle, and that's the anthropic principle that you have to realize, well, the circumstances, of course, on a planet like Earth have to be right to make life, for life to form, and then to evolve into creatures like, like actually us. So our location needs to be able to sustain intelligent life. And that can make the Earth 
a very special place. Right. And so if you think about this, yeah, you don't know which of these principles wins, right? We know according to the Copernican principle, the Earth cannot be a unique place. No, it would be very unlikely that the Earth is the only place in the whole visible universe where life exists. But it can be the anthropic principle can make it extremely rare. And this is something we don't, we don't know. Does our, our, neighbor, our neighbor stars, do they have planets like Earth and does life exist there? Or are we the only one in, in our own galaxy or uh, even in, uh, in the visible, in a large part of the visible universe, we are the only planet? This is something that we don't know at all. And the only thing we can do is try to observe and try to learn about other stars and other planets and see uh, what, what they are actually like. Um, another important question is, of course, when we talk about life, uh, we first have to agree upon what life actually is, right? And uh, I don't know whether there are biologists uh, in, the, in, the, in the audio organism, but once at the high school I learned that the organism is capable of reproduction, organization, growth, some other stuff I'm not completely sure about anymore what it, what it actually meant. Um, for astronomers, this is at this point not too important because if you ask a biologist, oh, can you please make life in the actual uh, lab for me, then uh, they will not be able to actually do that. Um, so what's really the aspects, what is important, if you think about a living organism, that it has very complex molecules that undergoes very complex chemistry. And that is, that is the key factor here. How do you make very complex molecules and how can you make circumstances that this complex chemistry can actually, can actually happen? Um, and then, yeah, what is of course uh, important there for this, uh, uh, this chain of thought is that we have to make the assumption that life started in a natural way from non-living material. And what I mean by that is that there was not a, 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 a super being, a, a god-like creature that, that pushed the button uh, at some point and said, and now there is life on Earth. Maybe that actually happened, but for the scientific discussion, this is not really useful. So then the question is, uh, yeah, how, how, can, how can life form and how often does this uh, occur? Uh, uh, is, the, or is the Earth uh, unique in some sense? Now, and what is nice, sorry that this uh, slide is in, is in Dutch here, um, there's of course one sample. We have the Earth itself and life started here. So what, what can we learn from uh, 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 life on Earth? Well, first of all, we now know that the solar system, the sun as a star and the Earth as a planet, uh, formed about 4.5 billion years ago. This is very nice, this is a process we can study now very well. There are areas in the Milky Way where from gas, uh, uh, gas clouds, stars actually form. And we can see disks around these stars of gas and dust uh, in which planets are forming now, right? And we can learn about this process and see how planets like Earth have actually formed. So that, that's a very uh, active part of, of research. Now, when, this, when the Earth formed, it was still a very hot uh, 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 circle of uh, uh, sphere of lava. Um, it had to cool down and then it, it, it gets a crust. Uh, that takes a few hundred uh, million years and then the, the oldest rocks uh, we can still find are about four, four billion years old. Now, the first fossils, the first evidence, chemical evidence for life is actually 3.5 billion years old. Now, if you ask, you ask different people, they will put that arrow a little bit closer by, or a little bit further. But about 3.5 billion years ago, it's very likely that the first life uh, formed around that time. So actually, on astronomical timescale, a few hundred million years, that sounds very long, but on the astronomical timescale, that's relatively short. So that means that if the circumstances are right, life can form relatively quickly. What we then also see that it actually, to uh, uh, get more co complex life, uh, uh, like cells with an extra nucleus, uh, plants and, and animals uh, um, divide, that, that, takes, that takes billions of years. That, that is apparently much more, much more difficult uh, to actually do. And then, you know, when you think about, uh, uh, for example, dinosaurs, I always thought dinosaurs are a very long time ago. That's only about, uh, what is it, 90 million years ago. On this time scale, this, this is just, this is very, very recent. If you think about us, human beings, we walk around here for 100 to 200,000 years. 
that's actually after 99.99% of the current age of the Earth. We, this is really in the blink of an eye of the on, the on the scale of the long history of the Earth. So the lesson from Earth, I think, is if the, if the circumstances are right, apparently life can, can form relatively quickly, then to evolve it into, into life like us, that, that, can, that can take billions of years. So the question is, if you uh, would find a planet where, where the circumstances are such that maybe life is formed, yeah, do, do not uh, immediately start to look for little green, uh, green man or something. You know, the, 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 the very simple uh, uh, life forms, that, that, that's possibly uh, the things that you want to look for and see how they can change the actual environment in which they live and, and such recognized biological activity. I'll talk a little bit more uh, about, that, uh, about that later. Um, so, and, and how can you then make life? No, can, that's also something I think we can learn uh, from life on Earth, namely that uh, we see on Earth that carbon is the base atom for, uh, for all life uh, that, we, that we know. It can uh, relatively easily form uh, the more complex molecules. It's very common, you know, it's the worry that there's no carbon around. And what is important, these molecules can easily dissolve in, in water, and that's what you need. You need an... Uh, uh, you need an, a medium in which you can, uh, uh, you can bring these uh, uh, complex molecules uh, in the actual vicinity of each other so that they can uh, uh, make their complex, complex chemistry. Uh, there could be an alternative. You, know, you could see, well, with silicon, uh, you can also make complex uh, atoms. That's actually a bit more difficult with silicon. Uh, and also, actually, we live on a silicon-rich planet. There is significantly more silicon on this planet than then there's carbon. Still, all the life that we know is actually carbon-based. Uh, carbon, uh, carbon so this is the reason why we think, well, uh, we know how actually chemistry works, so there is a, it's a very good bet to if we could find evidence for extraterrestrial life, the chances that it would be carbon-based uh, is very, very high. Um, and then what is important, that we think that uh, liquid water as a medium uh, in which you can dissolve uh, uh, these molecules is, is very important. And this is what we are going to use. Water is very common, um, but circumstances have to, de have to be right to find it as an actual liquid. Uh, it's often too cold, and it's in the ice form, of course. It's too warm, that it's in the gas form. Water is one of the most common molecules that we see in the universe. Uh, but, yeah, it has to be in the right uh, uh, temperature range, uh, and it, uh, it, there, ha there has to be pressure, otherwise you cannot make, make an actual liquid. So this is what we are going to look for, uh, uh, circumstances in the universe where we can find water as an actual liquid. And the uh, first thing we can do, of course, is uh, uh, we look at our solar system and see, okay, uh, what are the circumstances of the different planets uh, that we know? The nice is, uh, if you have an atmosphere on a planet, yeah, you, you automatically have actual pressure, and therefore you could, in principle, make an actual liquid. Now, the temperature on a planet is mainly dependent on the distance from the sun. So, uh, I don't know why I lost uh, Mercury, but uh, it, it should be, uh, should be, <laughs> should be here. Um, Mercury, uh, yeah, is, is about the size of our moon, a uh, little, little bit bigger. It's not large enough to, to hold an actual atmosphere. It's very close to the, to the sun, so you don't, there, there's no possible way to get liquid water on the, on the surface. Venus is uh, about 70% the distance from the sun and has a very thick atmosphere, has an enormous greenhouse effect, making it about 500, 600 Celsius on the surface. Uh, it's so warm that uh, all the water has boiled off uh, from, from the surface. It's a completely dry desert. So also here on Venus, you don't expect uh, any liquid water or any life to be present. Well, then, of course, uh, here on Earth, we are lucky. Uh, we are at the right distance from the sun that we have significant liquid water on the surface. Um, and you can sort of calculate, okay, if we put the Earth a little bit closer to the sun or a little bit further away from the sun, how much room, wiggling room do we actually have before the Earth start to uh, turn into a ball of ice or start to turn into a hot uh, desert like actually Venus is? Well, that's not completely clear. Uh, it depends on who you actually ask. But you could imagine there's such a zone, and we call that the habitable zone. 
That's not because you can live there, but it just means that there could, you could have planets there uh, with liquid water on their surface. It's also not clear how far you can extend this habitable zone. So it's very easy, it's very interesting uh, to look at Mars, because Mars is a very interesting planet in that respect. Um, for a long time, uh, 100 years ago, people uh, observed Mars and thought that they, they, they saw channels and possible, uh, 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 possible life. Uh, that was a big disappointment uh, when the first uh, uh, robots were sent to, to Mars and found just a completely dry desert. The problem with, with Mars is that it's significantly smaller than the Earth, about uh, one-tenth of its mass, and it also has big problems to hold a significant atmosphere. The atmosphere is only about one hundredth of the atmosphere of, uh, of the Earth. It is already more uh, distant uh, uh, from the Sun, and also there is uh, almost no greenhouse effect. Um, so it's very cold, it's right, uh, minus 180 Celsius or so. Uh, but also, the atmosphere is so thin that the strong UV radiation from the sun can reach the surface very easy. So even if you would have uh, a living organism with complex molecules, because of the UV radi radiation, yeah, actually complex molecules cannot survive on the surface on Mars. And there is no water. There is no liquid water possible on the surface of Mars. And still, Mars is very interesting because there's something very awkward and that is, there is very strong geological evidence of liquid water on Mars. Not now, but not so long ago. We're talking about maybe millions of years ago. There are dry river, river beds on some parts of Mars. And a million years ago, no, we're talking about timescales of billions of years. A million years is nothing. That's, very, that's, that's like yesterday. So why was there water yesterday and now it's a dry desert? We, we have some ideas why this is the case. There is actually a lot of water, but it's all in the form of ice on the, polar, on the, on, on the, on the poles, the north and south pole of, of, uh, of Mars. There are big reservoirs of water ice. If all that ice would be liquid, you could actually uh, get a, a 10 meter thick ocean over the whole surface of Mars. So that there is plenty of, of, of water, but how do you get it into, uh, into the gas phase or into, into the liquid phase? Well, there are some ideas about that, and that has to do with the way the orbit and the orientation of Mars that change, changes due to the gravity of Jupiter. What is now the case is that um, the, 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 the spin axis of Mars is relatively straight, meaning that when Mars turns around its axis and it turns around the Sun, there's not much difference between uh, summer and, and, and actual winter. There's actually all the time there is actually not much sunlight is reaching the, the actual poles. And therefore there's no opportunity to melt any of this ice. But due to the gravitational interaction of Jupiter on timescales of hundreds of thousands of years, this orientation of the spin axis changes. And it can actually, it can change so much that it's almost on its side. And then for half a Mars year, the sun is uh, shining fully on the actual uh, pole. Half a year, half, half a Mars year on the North Pole, then half a Mars year on the South Pole. And then there is plenty of opportunity to melt this, uh, this ice and you get uh, uh, water vapor into the atmosphere. The atmosphere gets thicker, uh, the greenhouse effect starts to, water is a very good uh, green, greenhouse uh, gas. And that could be an opportunity or, or periods that liquid water actually exists on the surface and that, that is causing the, these actual signatures that we see here. And who knows, you know, it's maybe Mars is like a desert that we have here, right? And once in the, in the decade it rains in the desert, and then you see suddenly everywhere flowers. Uh, you know, who knows whether, although we know no, 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 uh, no uh, big molecules can actually exist on the surface, but maybe deep in the, in the actual ground where there, where there is enough shielding, uh, you can find evidence uh, for biological activity. I think it will be very difficult, but it is enough reason for NASA and ESA to send robots and to start digging. And, and I think there are plans to, to land a rover and they, they, they scoop up uh, things from, from deep in the ground and to get a, a, another rocket and that brings it back uh, to, to actually Earth that we can actually an analyze it. This is all very, very, uh, very, very exciting. What is also very 
very interesting about Mars is, is that there are strong geological evidence that there was a, a 3.5 billion years ago, there was actually a big ocean on Mars, a shallow but a large part of the surface uh, was covered by an, by, uh, by an actual ocean. And that means that three and a half billion years ago, the circumstances of Mars were actually not that different from those on Earth. And that's also the period that life started on Earth. So who knows what, whatever happens on, on Mars and, and what kind of evidence can we still uh, find uh, about that uh, now. Now, if we go a little bit uh, further away, we go to Jupiter. Now, you can imagine if it's already so cold on Mars, uh, Jupiter is quite hopeless. Uh, and indeed, the radiation from, from the sun is not enough to uh, get you uh, above freezing point at all. But there are actually other ways to generate energy, and that are tidal forces. So uh, there are four big moons around Jupiter, uh, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. And uh, they, uh, they really feel the, the actual tidal force on Jupiter very much in which they get heated, they get tidally heated. And Io get tidally heated so much that it's, it's, it is volcanically active. Uh, there, is, there, is, there is no water on Io, it also it all uh, boiled off. And the first time I remember as a, as a child, I was very excited in the 1970s, uh, there were the first pictures of the voyagers, the Naya voyagers that, 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 that passed. Uh, uh, next to Jupiter, and it passed very close to Io and made a picture, and you, sa and you saw the volcanic plumes uh, coming, coming out of, out of Io. It's really fantastic. Um, now, Io, there will be no, no life, there's no atmosphere whatsoever, there's no water, but what's very interesting is the second moon, and that's uh, called Europa. It has under a thick layer of ice, but there is strong evidence now that it has a liquid ocean under, under, under this ice. And it gets heated from volcanic activity from the rocky core uh, of, that, uh, of that moon. And um, what is nice, there are bio biological schools uh, that think that life started on the bottom of the, of the actual ocean. And in maybe in very similar circumstances as you see now on, uh, on this moon. So that's also a very interesting habitat, a potential habitat for biological activity. The problem is, uh, how are we going to find out? You could send a, a robot and then has to drill a 10, uh, work 10 uh, kilometers deep uh, hole through the ice and then start to measure uh, what's, what's, what's in the actual water. This will be extremely difficult. Uh, but we have hopes to get some more information uh, um, in another way. There are some cracks in the actual ice and in, s in certain circumstances the water is, is pressed out into, the, uh, into a space, and actually spacecrafts can actually fly through these plumes and, and measure what, what kind of molecules are actually present. So th this, this may be a way to learn more about the, about, about the circumstances uh, under, the, under the ice. So there, there are two possible uh, places in the solar system. There's Mars and there, uh, there are the moons of Jupiter where possible life existed or can exist now. Uh, it will be difficult to find out, but if we do find out, uh, and the origin of that life is different from the origin of, of on the Earth, that would mean that already in our solar system there are two places where life started. That would be already amazing. If that's the case, then we would know, okay, everywhere in the Milky Way, every star you go to, the chances are very large that you find places where actually life is. So maybe the science uh, fiction uh, movies are actually right, if we, if we find that. Um, you can also do that if you really want to look for um, a, a, a world where life has really taken over a planet, like, like here, here on Earth, where life has a big influence on the planet. Yeah, that's, that's, not, that's clearly not present in our own solar system. So then we have to look, look to other stars um, and see whether there are other stars that have planets like Earth, um, and, and, and see whether we can find ev any evidence for the circumstances and uh, the possible the habitability and, and actual evidence for biological activity. Now, looking for planets around other stars is extremely uh, difficult. Um, for thousands of years, thousands of years, people have thought about other worlds, you know, other, other worlds in the universe. Um, and only 30 years ago, the first exoplanet, first, the first planet around another star uh, was found. 
that has to do with the following. I, uh, I started with this, uh, this actual talk with uh, imagining the, our sun as a football, and then we had the Earth at 10 meters, which was a little beat, and then the ping pong ball, which was Jupiter at about 50 meters. The next star, the next football, is in this scale thousands of kilometers away. Yeah, and, and the star you can see that, that are the bright stars in, in the sky, but you're interested in this, in this little beat, which only orbits in a few meters away, thousands of kilometers away from this bright star, this bright star which is millions to billions of times brighter than the, than the little Earth we are, we are actually looking for. So you, you can imagine what an enormous technical challenge that is uh, to find planets around other stars. Still, um, some great uh, strides have been made uh, after there had been many claims before and they were all refuted. Uh, in, in 1995, the first planet was found and a few years ago the Nobel Prize of Physics was actually awarded to this by two Swiss researcher and it's not that the planet itself was seen this is the planet was found through the gravitational interaction it has on a star and the way to explain that is as follows so here we have a planet uh, a system uh, the planet uh, turns around the star why does it uh, orbit the star because of gravity of course uh, but gravity works both sides so uh, the star also feels the gravity of the planet and what actually happens is the planet does not orbit the star, but both the planet and the star orbit, orbit the center of gravity. And of course, because the star can be a thousand times more uh, massive than the planet, the star only makes a, a very small uh, orbit around the center of mass, but the planet uh, uh, makes a big orbit. Now, you don't see the planet, but the star, we don't see it so much uh, move on the sky, but we can measure the velocity towards us and away from us using the Doppler effect and the way that works the atmosphere, the outer layers of the star are cooler and uh, there are also kind of uh, uh, atomic and ionic uh, gases that give uh, specific absorption lines and we can measure these very accurately. We can now um, measure uh, the radial velocity of a star to better than one meter per second. So I can, I can walk faster than we can measure the, the actual, uh, uh, than the accuracy of our measurements of other, other stars. And what we have learned that, and that's really something, that this is something we didn't know, right? 30 years ago, we didn't know whether planets around star, is that a common thing or, or are we, is this very rare? So we know now, no, planets around stars are very normal. Uh, if you think about Jupiter, uh, Jupiter mass planets, uh, about one in 10 stars uh, uh, have a Jupiter-like planet. Uh, if you go to Neptunes or Uranus, which are a factor 10 smaller or so, um, uh, about one in five stars have them. If you go to Earth mass planets, so the, the, the smaller the masses, the more common, Earth mass, Earth, Earth mass planets are every, everywhere. Most of the stars that we look at are able to do the measurements on have planets with the mass of the Earth. And maybe that's not so strange. The Sun itself has already Venus and, and the Earth, so two uh, Earth, Earth mass planets, and then we have Mars and, and Mercury, if you go even further down in mass. So planets are, are very common. That's a very important uh, lesson. We have learned already for, of thousands uh, of planets that we know of. Now, this, this radial velocity method is not going to tell you too much. It's going to tell you something about the mass of the planet and something about the orbit. Uh, but we don't see any light of the actual planet, so, so we, we don't know anything more about them. But there's a second method, and that is, uh, that is, that is the transit method. And what happens here is if you're lucky, and the orientation of the orbit is such that it goes in front of the star, this is something that we can, we can actually see. Not that we see this football uh, a few thousand kilometers away as a, as a little disk uh, through our exit telescope. No, it's, it stays actually a point source. We are almost all stars in the sky are just, are just a point source. But we can measure the amount of light coming from, the, from, from an exostar. And if a dark object crosses a star, it will, it will dim a little bit. It will be become a little bit uh, fainter. And if you think about the sun is 10 times bigger than Jupiter, so the disk, the, the area of the disk of Jupiter is a factor 100 smaller than, 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 the, than the sun. If you have a sun-like star with a gas giant like Jupiter, 1% of the light will be blocked. 
Now, me measurement of 1% of the brightness of a star is very easy to actually do. If you have a telescope with a simple uh, uh, CCD camera uh, in your record garden, you could actually measure that. The only problem is you have to know exactly which star to look at when uh, to actually see in a transit, because they're they are quite rare. And uh, when, if, when uh, 10 or so of these, uh, these gas giants were actually found uh, with the radial velocity uh, 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 method, what's very weird about these first planets is that they are in very short orbit. So we are in 365 days. Mercury, the closest to the sun, is, is in 88 days. The first planets found were actually Jupiter-like planets is in, in only a few days. The, uh, the first one actually is, is in 4.2 days. So they are in very short orbits. And uh, when they have found a few of them, the nice thing about the short orbit is, is that the probability that they go in front of the star are, are much bigger. So uh, uh, they have calculated uh, after the first 10, 15 were found, oh, we have to check whether one of these transits, and there was one, HD 209548B, I will later uh, examine you on that number. Um, actually, this observation was done from an actual parking, parking lot. They had calculated... Uh, okay, this planet, when is the next transit? Oh my God, it's going to be this evening. And they, uh, they set up the system and they, and they observed it. And, and uh, yeah, you can see here, uh, it's about a bit more than 1% of the light is blocked. So it's a, actually, this is also a sun-like star. So it's a bit larger than Jupiter with the Doppler effect. They already measured the actual mass. So now you get the mass and the radius, and that's nice because then you have actually a density so you can uh, say something about the buildup of this uh, planet. And this is clearly a gas giant with a, a little bit lower density, mean density, than, than actually Jupiter. Now, and what is then has become a whole new sport, that is we can actually measure something about the atmosphere as well. And that, I think, uh, this is very exciting. So what happens when a planet moves in front of the star, some of the starlight is blocked, but also a little bit of starlight is filtering through the atmosphere, and in the atmosphere are certain gases that, that actually ag absorb this, uh, this stellar light uh, at, at certain wavelengths, depending on, the, uh, on, on what gases are actually present. And by measuring very accurately what the spectrum looks like of the star when the planet is not transit transiting, and then compare that, that when the planet is transiting and look at the difference, then you can see from the extra absorption what, what gases are present in the actual atmosphere. Half an orbit later, uh, we actually, if we measure thermal, uh, uh, thermal emission, we can actually measure directly how much heat is coming from these, from these planets. We also get uh, a, little, uh, a little dip, and we can actually monitor uh, the whole orbit, and then we see actually there's more emission coming from this part of the orbit than from this part of the orbit, and that's because here we look at the night side, it's actually cooler, and here we look at the, at the actual day side. And I have an uh, example of that. Here, this is uh, uh, thermal emission uh, at 4.5 uh, micrometers. Um, and you see here, uh, this is actually here, uh, this is very deep, because this is the actual uh, tran transit. This is the moment the planet blocks the starlight. Well, the surface of the star is very hot, so you actually have a very deep uh, uh, measurement. This is, this is the amount of light that we, of the amount of emission as function of time. And what we see here, this is the moment the planet goes behind the actual star. So what we know now, oh, this is the level. At this moment, these few hours, the planet is not visible. So we know actually this dashed, uh, this dotted line is everything below this line is light that we get from, from the star alone. And everything above this dotted line is the emission we get from, from, from the actual planet. And what we see here, near the secondary eclipse, as we call it, there's much more thermal emission than what we get from near the uh, actual transit. And this is because here we look at the day side, and here we look at the, at the actual night side. So now we are actually learning something about the temperature distribution uh, uh, on the surface, on the, on the atmospheric surface of this gas giants. And what is nice even, if you expect, uh, the nice thing is that these planets are actually locked. That means always the same, same side of the planet is facing the, the actual star. Our, our, our moon also has that. We also always see the same uh, side of, of, 
of our, of, of our moon. So what you expect is that right in the part, the planet that is closest to the actual star, where the star is straight ahead on the, on the sky, that should be the hottest part. But what you actually see, no, that's not the case. It's actually the hottest part is a little bit earlier. Uh, and that has to do, you can actually calculate that you expect enormously strong jet, jet winds that are actually distributing the, 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 the heat from the star that is absorbed is actually transferred a little bit to the actual night side. And that, that oh, that is, uh, I go back. Um, and that's what you, what you see here. It's actually a little bit to the, to the east of the, of the, uh, of the day side of the planet is the, is the, is the hottest uh, part. Okay, I want to say a, a little bit very uh, quickly about uh, the research we do uh, in my uh, research group. And because the observations I showed so far were all done by observations from space. Space has a lot of, uh, makes things, e it's, space is very expensive, but it makes life easier because you don't have to look through our own atmosphere. And I, I can explain here why it's so, why it is a problem to, why it is a challenge to look with your telescope from, uh, from the actual ground is because we have to look through our own atmosphere. It has all sorts of molecules. Uh, the star we look at has some atoms or uh, molecules uh, and ions. And of course, the, the planet, that's what we are interested in, uh, in and may have the same uh, molecules. For example, we're interested in, in water vapor. How are we going to find out whether the water we see is fr from our own atmosphere or, or from uh, or from the planet. So we have to find a way to, to actually deal with that because there's a big advantage because telescopes on, the, telescopes on the ground are relatively cheap, you can build them much bigger. And therefore, um, uh, it would be extremely powerful if we find methods to use these ground-based telescopes uh, to actually target the atmospheres of these extrasolar planets. Now, and that's what, what we are expert in uh, in our uh, group in Leiden. We have a beautiful observatory uh, in Leiden from, 18, uh, from the 1850s. The weather is the same as here, uh, so the, uh, it's, it's, it's terrible. Um, so if you build a very big facility, um, yeah, you don't want to do that here. And, and so you are looking for places uh, on Earth where the climate is such where uh, you know, most of the time you can observe, and, and the best places are actually uh, in a desert where it doesn't rain, and you're very high up somewhere on a mountain and northern, uh, northern Chile in the Atac Atacama Desert is one of the best uh, places. And this is uh, the VLT, the Very Large Telescope. This is a European uh, telescope, a European obs ob observatory. Um, and just to give you an idea, each of these uh, domes here have an 8-meter telescope. And what this means, that, that, that's an, uh, that is... This is a parabolic mirror of about eight meters, 8.2 meters, and it focus, focus the light in one point, and in that focal point you can put your instruments and take your image or take your spectrum. And there are two big reasons why you want a bigger, teles bigger telescope. The bigger the telescope, the more uh, flux you can measure, so the, the fainter the objects, the further you can uh, look. Um, and also the bigger the mirror, uh, the sharper the actual images. So these are two very important reasons why you build, uh, build a larger telescope. Now this, is an, uh, <coughs> this is maybe a little bit difficult uh, slide, but I'll, I'll try to explain it. This is the kind of work that we do. So what is, what is helping you enormously if you do this kind of work from the ground is that you um, do measurements at very high spectral resolution. And it means that we measure the, from the light that we receive from a star and a planet to about an accuracy of 100 thousandths of a wavelength. And uh, the great thing about that is, is that you get sensitive to, to, to the actual Doppler effects. And these Doppler effects are very important to make this uh, distinction between molecules in our own atmosphere and molecules from the planet or from the actual star that we look at. That has to do with, we are on Earth, we are traveling with 30 kilometers per second around the sun. You don't actually notice that, but we go really, really fast now. Um, 
And uh, the sun is going around the Milky Way uh, in about two, 200 million years. So we have our own velocity uh, in the Milky Way. You have an, we look at this other star who, had, who has a different orbit. So there is a relative velocity there. And then this planet itself is also speeding uh, uh, around the star. So there are, very, there are several different uh, uh, Doppler effects that add up in such a way that, th that we can make an actual distinction between uh, molecules or atoms or ions in our own atmosphere uh, and those uh, uh, on the star or on the planet. To give you a nice example is uh, this. If we look at the transiting planet here, this is uh, the Earth is here, so we observe it from this side. Uh, of course, this planet doesn't go in a straight line in front of the star. It is a, a, a circular orbit, so that means in the beginning of the transit here, actually the planet moves a little bit towards us, so the light is blue shifted, and at the end of the transit, it is a little bit of red shifted. So if we now measure this extra absorption, uh, which is happening in the atmosphere, <coughs> sorry, then um, we actually can observe that during the transit, the Doppler motion of the absorption changes. And this is what, I sh what we show here. This is a very hot planet. It's a few thousand Kelvin. It's in a very short orbit around a, 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 a very hot star also. Um, this is uh, um, uh, iron, iron vapor. So you can already imagine what kind of temperatures uh, are actually uh, uh, present there. This is the velocity at which we measure the iron vapor. And this is the phase, so this is time. This dashed line tells you this is the beginning of this transit and this is the end of the transit. And this is the, uh, the actual uh, extra absorption that we get from this iron vapor. In the beginning, it's blue shifted. That's this part of the transit. The planet is a little bit moving towards us. And in this part, it is red shifted. It's moving away from us. So this tells us directly with what velocity the planet is orbiting uh, the actual star. Now, and the nice thing is if you actually put this in the rest frame of the planet, that would be this dashed line, Hey, we actually see, oh, it's difficult to see, but it's actually, a, there's an extra blue shift here. And that has to do with when this is the star and the planet moves in front of the star, the hot part is here, away from us, the cold part is towards us, the, the night side, and actually uh, atmosphere is with uh, a few kilometers per second is moving from the hot part to the actual uh, cold, uh, cold part. And these, and these winds, uh, we, can, we can actually measure in this way. And what we even see that in the beginning, this wind is absent and we only see it in the second part. And that has to do that during the transit, the orientation changes a little bit. And we see different parts of the atmosphere. At the morning part, there is no iron. It's too, it's too cold. While in the evening part, it has been that this, this, this actually for a few hours, this gas has been circulating and it's, it's very hot. There is iron there and therefore only for parts of the transits, we see the iron with, with high velocity coming actually towards us. So I think this is, this is very exciting. If you think about is this football several thousands kilometers away, there's a little ping pong ball uh, in a few meters uh, 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 turning around this, this star, and uh, we can learn about what gases are present, uh, what kind of temperatures on the, on the day side, on the night side. Uh, we, can, we can learn about winds even uh, on these planets. And we can even go a little bit further. When you have this information at high spectral resolution, if you don't look at transits, but planets you can actually isolate and you can just directly measure uh, the thermal spectrum. Now, what happens, you know, we, we measure the, surf the, the atmospheric surface layers of, these, of this planet. What happens if this planet is spinning? Then from this part of the atmosphere, it's coming towards you. So you get your very narrow line is, is blue shifted. On this part, it is red shifted. So actually what happens if the planet rotates, your lines become broader. And the, bro and the faster it spins, the broader you, your, your lines become. And that's also something we actually measured a few years ago for the first time for this planet, Beta Pictoris b. It's about 60% larger uh, than our own Jupiter because it's young. And it spins with 25 kilometers per second around its axis. And if you do the cal cal calculation here, it actually means it uh, spins around its axis in about eight, eight uh, hours. So the length, the length of day on this planet is about eight hours. Also that, this is also information we can learn about these gas giants. Now, I want to go uh, for the last uh, 10 or so minutes, 
Uh, well, this I will skip. We can also do atmospheric gases, molecules. We can actually also do isotopes uh, recently. So uh, we also uh, are, are learning a lot, uh, a lot about that. Um, we talked about gas giants. And uh, these are the ping pong balls. But we, we want to go to the little beads. And, and these beads are 10 times uh, smaller. The, the disk, the area of the disk is 100 times smaller. So anything you want to do, if you have a sun-like star and you want to go to Earth-like planets, it's going to be 100 times more difficult. So we need a 100 times larger, uh, larger uh, telescope. So this is a real problem. But there is a way out. And that is because stars like the sun are actually quite large. The most stars in our Milky Way, the large majority of the stars in the Milky Way, are significantly smaller and cooler than our own sun. And the smaller the star, the easier it gets again to, to, see the, to see the smaller planets, because it is really about the relative size of the star and the exoplanet. And we can, uh, this is very exciting, we can go to our nearest neighbor. Our neighbor's nearest star is Proxima San, San uh, Taurus, because it, it's actually a, a dwarf star. It's only 15% of the size of our own sun. And it is so weak that you cannot see it with the naked eye. So we, we, you know, our nearest neighbor star we cannot see on the exosky, which is quite an amazing thing to, to actually uh, think of. It's because it's thousand times uh, weaker uh, uh, than, than our own sun. And uh, for uh, several years now, radio, very accurate radio velocity measurements, Doppler measurements have been taken. And what you see here, this is the, the velocity of the star of Proxima towards us. And you see here a very nice rhythm and there is an 11, there's a planet about the mass of the Earth in an 11 day orbit. Now, I think 11 days, okay, that's going to be very hot. But no, Proxima, the star, is a thousand times fainter than our Sun. And actually, a planet in an 11 day orbit, you can easily calculate, receives about as much energy as a planet in our solar system would be in an orbit between the Earth and Mars. So actually, it's, it's probably a little bit cooler than, uh, than the actual Earth. But this is very exciting. And now we've learned, you see, actually, there are some, some maybe some other trends. And there are indeed two other planets have been found. There's also a mini Venus has been found in a five-day orbit. And there is another planet on a much, much larger distance. And indeed, all these small dwarf stars we look at, they have actual planets. They are very uh, small mass planets. You hardly see any giants like Jupiter. But small planets are very common around uh, other small stars. This is a very famous system. This is the TRAPPIST-1 system. This is found by a Belgium research group, you can imagine. And uh, this is actually the smallest stars you, you, you can actually make. It's about uh, uh, 10 times smaller than our own sun. It has seven planets. They all have about the size of the Earth, and they all go in front of, of their actual star. So we can actually measure their sizes. We can measure their masses, and they all have about an Earth mass. They all have about an Earth size. So it's amazing. Already w one planet having set seven uh, other, other Earth, and it goes from uh, uh, one and a half days to about 20-something days orbit. Now, these will be very uh, warm, uh, but three of these, they may have such a climate that actually liquid water is possible on, there, on the surface. So it's very exciting. So now we want to learn about these planets, and how are we... How are we gonna gonna do that? Now, um, if we want to, how how could we ever find out there is actually uh, that there is actually life on such a planet? Now we can find out whether there is water and, and, and other gases, but actually, um, life on Earth has a very large influence on the composition of our own atmosphere, and that has to do with the molecular oxygen. This is again that is this is the history of the Earth. Uh, about 4.5 uh, billion years ago it was formed, and these are the different gases, the concentration of the gases present. Of course, we have a, a molecular nitrogen-based atmosphere. Here, uh, somewhere here, life was formed, and then at some point it starts to make oxygen. And, and uh, it takes a long time because it, before this oxygen ends up in our atmosphere, because uh, the, 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 the ocean can actually absorb enormous amounts, but then that gets sat saturated, and all the oxygen that is present in our atmosphere that we breathe is purely here because of biological activity, because of the plants uh, uh, that are here. If life would uh, stop, within a few hundred thousand years, all the oxygen would 
would, would be actually gone. That, that goes very fast. So that would be if we get some kind of, uh, I don't know what happens, and th this would go immediately down on this scale. You wouldn't even see it. It's just a vertical, uh, a vertical drop. Um, so this is our sort of uh, the ho holy grail. Can we start to see like objects, like worlds, like uh, Proxima b, could we, find, or could we find evidence for this molecular oxygen? Because it's very difficult in other ways to actually make, make molecular oxygen. So uh, that, that would the only way to, to have it present in an atmosphere is by constantly making it uh, uh, due to biological activity. Now, how can we do that? There's some, uh, you know, we have, we have arrived to such an interesting place now over the last 30 years. Uh, we have actually achieved a lot. That's not because we are getting smarter. That has to do that our instruments are getting constantly, constantly better. And uh, we can look a little bit in the future what's going to happen in a few years. And one very important thing is the James Webb Space Telescope. You probably have heard of it. A $10 billion mission. People have worked uh, on it for, for 20 or 30 years or so. And it's giving uh, fantastic uh, results. Um, I don't have much time, but I want to show you one result because this is very exciting. I showed you the, the Exotrappist-1 system. And... Um, the easiest planet to observe is this first planet because that is that is the hottest planet. And what we want to, uh, we or the, the, this actual team wanted to find out is, um, can we see the thermal emission from the day side of this uh, planet? Because that tells us something about the climatological circumstances. And uh, this is it's very difficult to see, but this is uh, the little dip, and uh, it means that it's about. 500 Kelvin, uh, so 300 uh, Celsius, on the surface of this planet. Now that is a little bit of pity, because if you calculate, if the you assume this planet does not have an atmosphere, meaning that all the radiation it receives from the star stays on the actual day side, the night side will be extremely cold, and all the energy it receives, it gets on the day side. You expect a 500 uh, Kelvin temperature. So this implies that the atmosphere of this planet, if it has an atmosphere, is very thin. It does not have the capacity to uh, absorb the stellar energy and bring it to, to the actual night side. So, and I heard a rumor that within a couple of weeks we will hear here whether TRAPPIST-1c, that's, so that's the second planet. It's a little bit further away from the star, so maybe that one does actually have an at atmosphere. We, it's going to be very exciting to go to planet D, E, and F because those are the ones in the, in the habitable zone where life is possible. Unfortunately, you can already see this is very difficult measurements for, for the James, James Webb. That, that, will, that will not be actually possible. So is there then a way for TRAPPIST or for the Proxima planet to do something else? And yes, we have another toy coming online, and that is this one. This is the extremely large telescope. It's built on a mountain uh, 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 30, 40 kilometers away from the previous picture I showed. This is, of course, a drawing, and it has not an 8-meter mirror, but it's 39 meters. So it uh, does not even fit uh, uh, in, this, in this lecture room. And um, the observations of observing a planet next to a bright star goes with the diameter, the actual the accuracy with which you can do that goes to the, power, uh, of the, f to the fourth power of the actual diameter. So a, a, a telescope like this will be hundreds of times better uh, than, than what we can work with now. It's also a very big uh, uh, project with many countries. And I actually, uh, uh, I'm uh, serving in some kind of uh, committee and I was able uh, a few weeks ago to actually visit it. And uh, yeah, it's not a dream, you know, this is not only drawings. Uh, they're actually, uh, uh, the, the, the actual dome is being built, uh, the, the mirror is being uh, polished and, and such on. Uh, it should be finished in about uh, five, five, uh, five years. And, and, uh, and, and Holland has a very important part in this. One of the three uh, instruments, uh, first, first light instrument is actually built in Holland here and uh, will actually be very good for the, for the kind of observations that we want to do to observe extrasolar planets. Um, I think I've reached the end. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Ignas, for a very interesting talk. <coughs> okay, uh, we went to a great journey throughout space. Uh, it's time now for questions, so I guess there are lots of them. When you uh, um, 
do this research in uh, when the news is being brought out of a new planet being discovered. You see all these very beautiful, fancy graphics nice and yeah. creative. There's, I think there's a really large amount of creativity in it, but in what level is the actual data being used to create these imageries? Um, that really depends on the researcher in, involved. So um, it also depends a little bit on the on the actual message you wanna you wanna bring out, right? Um, so um, uh, we work with art artists who are uh, who to actually do 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 this actually a lot, and they ask you questions, right? Do you think there are clouds, or uh, you know what 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 do you expect on such a such a such a planet? So and then then they start drawing something, and of course we we don't know at all what they actually look like. But yeah, they 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 really make an effort to that it's a reasonable chance uh, that it looks like that. I like uh, you know I showed uh, Proxima. We don't know anything, <laughs> so uh, uh, we don't even know whether it has an atmos uh, atmos atmos atmosphere. And uh, yeah, these kind of structures, of course, the geological activity or that we don't know anything about it. We don't know anything about it. But on the other hand, maybe, you know, it looks like this. Or maybe there are they're just forests everywhere. Who knows? Yeah, in, the, in the next image, you actually have some colors of them. Do you, know, do you sort of know the color of, or the main color then of the, the planet? I mean, you see the colors over yeah, here. Yeah, so, so this is just... Uh, the first ones will be, will be hot. Uh, so why they have drawn there a blue one, I don't know. Uh, you could expect uh, further away at some point... They will be more ice-like, so they will probably have an icy surface. So the, the outer ones will be more more white. Uh, maybe at some point there will be wa water on the surface, and then they, there may be more more blue. But yeah, I I, I think uh, I, you would not expect a green planet here. No. So so even in this drawing, this level of detail is already too much based on the data. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Clear. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. It speaks to the imagination. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Okay, I have, I have a question about uh, um, we were ab people were able uh, using a radio telescope that were combined to uh, make a picture or kind of a picture of a black hole, so very detailed. Um, but it, this is of course an, another spectrum. Uh, can this spectrum also be used to study exoplanets? Um, yeah, so, the, so if you think about, uh, um, so what I've talked here about is, is mainly uh, uh, optical light or, or infra infrared light. If you go to radio, yeah, the wavelengths are, are uh, orders of magnitude uh, uh, larger. Um, so if you just have uh, like an actual star um, or, or a hot planet where no nothing in principle is happening, uh, you don't expect at radio wavelengths to 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 measure much, no. But this is basically the the, the Rayleigh gene scale, and and uh, there's hardly any flux coming from uh, uh, from these kind of objects, except there's one difference, and that is if your um, emission mechanism is not thermal, but uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, that there are other other types of uh, of emission, and if you look at the planets. Um, for example, Jupiter is at a very long radio wavelength. It's very bright. It's, it's, uh, at some points, it's even brighter than the, than, than, the, than the actual sun. And that has to do with the interaction between the, um, the, mag the magnetic fields of, of Jupiter and, and uh, yeah, ionic particles that, that are hitting uh, uh, the, the, the actual planet. And, and so that, that can give you very bright uh, uh, radio emission. And that could, um, so people have been looking for radio emission from, from, from planets uh, because that could tell you something about the, the magnetic fields of these planets. But that's a very a specific research area, you could say, and, uh, and it has li limited info on that. Yeah. Uh, hi again, thank you for your presentation. Uh, you mentioned that uh, it's easier to do observation outer space, but we can build better satellites in, not satellites, better observation centers in Earth. But 
nowadays with the resurgence of like satellites that we put in the orbit and amount of satellites we put in lower orbits such as uh, Starlink, does it affect the uh, effectivity of the observations and the research that you do? Um, so you, you, you ask uh, whether these kind of Starlink uh, satellites uh, could actually ruin obs observations. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Yeah. People are very much worried about that. Um, uh, uh, Starlink and some other uh, um, uh, companies are, are launching an enormous amount of, uh, of uh, sat satellites. Um, the, what is a little bit lucky here is that they, they launch so, mu so much because they are in very low orbits. And um, if you're very low orbits, it means that the reach of such a light satellite is very local. That's why you need thousands, because if you want to cover the whole surface of the Earth, on every position, you need a few satellites. So if you let them, you could imagine if you let them fly a meter high, you can imagine how, how millions of satellites you would need to actually cover the whole, the whole area. So, and the lucky thing is about, because they are low, um, uh, they hit the Earth's shadow quite, uh, quite, uh, quite quickly. So actually for a large part of the night, you don't actually see them. It's only uh, when the sun comes actually up or when the sun goes down uh, or has, has gone down, those are the, the hour bef before and after that, that are the moments that the sat satellites catch actually the actual sun sunlight and that they may be an actual nuisance. But for most of the nights, that's not a problem. What we were worried about, because this is getting so cheap to actually do this, that the satellite, when they get higher up, it becomes more and more of an actual problem. So, so. Um, yeah, we are working with these companies to find solutions to make them stop uh, doing this. <laughs> but it's difficult. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. Um, I was wondering how far our uh, creativity in imagining what life could be like is constraining us. You also hit upon that. Um, something I read a while back is in microbial research, because in, on Mars they want to grow plants, and so you first need a layer of microbes. So they've been trying how adaptive microbes are to, for example, situations like very low temperatures. And what they found is that what the microbe does in, in response to that, it changes the ratio between saturated and unsaturated liquid fats, um, and then basically can live in much lower temperatures. And they mute it very fast, of course. Um, for us, that would be very difficult to adapt to, but this really raises the question, how limited is our creativity when we talk about intelligent life? Also, yeah. I wonder if intelligent life, how you would define it? Is it being able to develop the technology to destroy yourself? But that's sarcasm. <laughs> <laughs> that's all the uh, different uh, point. <laughs> yeah, you're, you are, you're absolutely right. right? We, we, our thinking is always from a, from, a, from a framework that we actually understand and that we... That that we, that we know. What I do think is that the, uh, although we don't understand the biology much and, and what, the, what the opportunities of chances are uh, in, in a broad scale, uh, chemistry we, we know. So I, I, I think that uh, you know, carbon-based life, we can be pretty sure about that, that that would be, if we go to an extra extraterrestrial setting, that, that, that if there is life, it would be based on carbon as well. How the the biochemistry would work, uh, I'm not enough of an actual uh, expert to actually answer that. But you know, so the way life is set up here with RNA and DNA, and, and whether you could also do that in an actual different way, that I don't actually know. And I, you can imagine how difficult it is to to do research on that. So, uh, but yeah, it's it's true. We have to be open um, open minded. So so what what we try to do and our yeah, there, there are people working on that. Is you know, how would you recognize that something something is is odd? So so you, you you measure up an atmosphere, you measure all sorts of gases, and you understand what the circumstances are, uh, the geophysical mechanisms that are present, and then you think, oh, that's strange. On such a setting, you would not expect oxygen. Why? So, so that would be a way to find out. Hey, there must be an active source of oxygen, and what and what could that actually be? And maybe there are other molecules that 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 could have such an actual role. And that's not saying anything about what kind of mechanism uh, is actually present. Just basically saying we observe a planet with certain properties, 
could we imagine something that works like life and that would exist on there? So searching it the other way around, not defining life and searching a planet, but finding a planet and searching for life. That's the yeah, question I would also ask. Yeah, so, so uh, could we imagine that the planet is actually habitable? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, that, that, that would be your first step, right? So, so you're trying to understand what are the circ circumstances of the planet. Is there, for example, water? Because we think water is actually important. So that there are, you, could, you could think about, uh, if, if you take as example uh, Proxima b, or here one of the Trappist uh, planets, you will first want to understand, does it have actually an atmosphere? And then you want to understand what gases are present in the atmosphere. Is there actually water? And, and so you build up this actual picture of the actual circumstances in there. And then you can start to actually think about, okay, could actually life no, exist there? Uh, thank you for your presentation. And I have a question. As the light needs time to travel for us to actually notice any changes, um, does it mean that nowadays we can uh, not notice that there might be a life on the other planet somewhere very far? And what can we do about it to actually decrease the uh, time difference that we uh, determine the changes? Yeah, so uh, what happens uh, because, uh, because the finite speed of light, yeah, anything that we observe is always history. So uh, the, the, the sun is eight, eight minutes away. Uh, um, if you go to other stars, we're talking about years, right? So the Proxima is 4.3 light years away. So we look at it, it's four years past. This Trappist, I think, uh, is uh, 15 uh, light, light years or so. So we, we see 15 years in the past. You have to realize on astronomical time scale, this is nothing. We're talking about millions, billions of years. If you think about the geological uh, changes or even, even the biological changes on Earth, well, we're talking on time scales of, of millions of years. So, so you don't expect, if we look at, at the stars around us, you don't expect uh, any changes. Now, the further you go, of course, the more you go in history. So if you would go to the other side of our Milky Way, we're talking about uh, tens of thousands of years, the problem with that is, you know, every, any object which is 10 times further away is 100 times more difficult to, to, to actually see. So, so all the studies we do is, is around our nearest, nearest uh, neighbors. So if we, if we think about, uh, because we use that in our field, if we want to learn about the history of, of the uni universe, then we go, we look at other galaxies and galaxies that are very far away, because then you can really look hundreds of millions and billions of years uh, in, in the past. And then you could, for example, see that, hey, a few billion years ago, the universe looked different from, it, from, from actually now. So that, that, but that's only on the very large distances, and there's no way we can ever learn about the planets on these, on these distances. Yes, you, you said uh, if, if there's a planet and we see uh, uh, oxygen, much oxygen, it's, it's an indication of there could be life. Um, but it's an indication. And earlier you, you said for life there is complex, complex molecules necessary. Um, now I was thinking, can we see complex molecules directly on another planet? For instance, Earth is, green, is a green, more or less green, uh, so there's much chlorophyll. Yep. I don't know if, if it's visible from the outside, and, and maybe complex molecules can be seen on other planets too. Is it possible? Yeah, so uh, uh, the chlor chlorophyll uh, molecule has a very uh, a specific uh, spectrum. It has a green edge. And uh, in principle, uh, um, if a planet would be completely covered in, in, in plants, uh, like, like here on Earth, you could measure that, that, that signature. It will be very difficult. So uh, our, our our 39 meter will 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 not not be actually enough to, to actually do that. But you know the way I see this, um, you know, if in the coming uh, 10, 20 years we're going to find planets where there's molecular oxygen and we don't understand why, that will be an incentive to think about. Okay, and now how can we learn more about this? Right? Can we f finding direct evidence for for life as you, as you say will be extremely difficult. But that doesn't mean it's not actually possible. Yeah, uh, I want to ask a question regarding uh, what I learned about um, stars that are 
binary stars are more common than single star system, does the technique that you mentioned here in the presentation is also generalized to, to that kind of system, that kind of star system? Yeah, it's um, uh, about half of the stars we see are part of a binary system. Uh, so that means two, two stars orbit each other. It makes life very difficult. So we stay away from binary stars. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's, it's interesting in its own to see whether planets can actually form around binary stars, so, so pe people mm. search for them. But it, it, it's, it's nice to actually know and to understand samples of, of planets around binary stars because it teaches us something. But anything more difficult than actually that, no, no, we, we stay away from binaries. Mm. Yeah. Um, so first of all, I think you have a magnificent, magnificent work. And uh, I would like to ask you two questions. First of all, when are the aliens going to come? And second of all, um, how does your daily life work change your perspective about the world and the life? Mm. Ooh, that are very deep questions. Well, the first question is actually a very interesting one. When are the aliens coming? So this is a... Um, um, it's actually, it's, a, it's, it's an interesting problem. Because when you think about uh, the history uh, of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the Earth, right? Um, you know, we are only here for a f since a few, few hundred thousand years. Uh, our advancements uh, have been enormous. And uh, yeah, we may travel to, to Mars soon, right? And, and how long will it take before we can travel to the other stars? Now, stars are very different, so 100,000 times further away than Mars. So don't, don't, it's not easy. But you could imagine, okay, maybe not in the next thousand years, but 10,000 10, years, 100,000, a million years. A million years is still a blink of an eye in the history of the universe. So you would, if we don't destroy ourselves, you would expect, you know, that we would at some point travel the actual stars. And then why not 10, 100 million years later, we have populated the whole galaxy. Now, you have to realize that these 100 billion of stars in our Milky Way have all different ages. So there are planets there, like Earth, where life started, which are billions of years older than the actual Earth is. So where are all these aliens? Because they should have, uh, they should have populated the whole Milky Way. So they aren't there, or they are actually ignoring us. That's, of course, also possible. <laughs> um, but it, it could also mean that there are these uh, bottlenecks in the biological the, the uh, development. And we see that in, in the history of the Earth, we see life starts that goes very quickly, but then the, the evolution seems to stop and it takes a billion years for a, for a cell and nucleus uh, to form. And, and there are all these certain biological steps that are so unlikely to happen that they take a very long time uh, to happen. And, and that happened a few times in the history uh, of, the, of the Earth. And it could well be that in our future, there are also these, these bottlenecks that just take so long that traveling to the stars is maybe just too actually difficult. There's no way to, to keep our, our DNA safe and, and such a long actually travel. And therefore, for, for, for bio, biological beings, it's not possible to actually travel to the stars. That, that, that could be a solution. Or when brains of biological species uh, develop, they have a tendency to actually kill and kill like, off uh, the whole planet. And that, that could be another solution for this actual problem. Yeah. And that's maybe also my, my, my view on the actual world, that we have to be very careful uh, about our planet. Yeah, in, in the past, uh, I heard from uh, the from a SETI project. Uh, can you uh, give a status update about that? Uh. Yeah, well, the, the short status update is that they haven't found uh, anything. But so, so SETI <laughs> is... Uh, the search for signals. So this is another way to, to, to search for, for life. Eh? You can, uh, what we try to do is uh, you don't expect any message or something from a, a single cellular uh, uh, org organism. Um, but you know, if there are uh, evolved uh, uh, species somewhere on the planet, they may, may build a giant laser and, and start to signal us. Right? They may have their telescope see that there is molecular oxygen here. And they think, well, maybe there is actually life on, on planet Earth, whatever name they actually give it, and uh, let's, let's signal them and see whether we get a signal back. So there are 
Uh, there's in particular one SETI group in the world that is building uh, radio uh, telescopes uh, that monitor the actual sky uh, to, to see uh, uh, whether any signals uh, are, are coming. And, and they've done that since the 1960s, but they haven't found anything. And I think that the real issue here is uh, maybe life is common. Eh? You see, uh, uh, maybe you know, already our neighboring star has, has life. But advanced life and the enormous time scales it takes for, for that to happen, the climatological circumstances have to be very stable. And that's maybe, that's maybe extremely rare. That I, I actually think that that is extreme, that we are on Earth have been well, lucky between quotes because of several elements in the solar system. One very important is that we have a very big moon that keeps our orbit stable, and that keeps our, our, our spin axle stable. For example, Mars doesn't have a moon. That's why it's constantly changing its tilt. Earth does, doesn't actually have that, and that's making our climate very stable. Uh, that we have a gas giant planet like Jupiter really helps in catching a lot of uh, rocks and stones which would other end up uh, on, on the actual Earth killing uh, a lot of a uh, lot of species so there could be all sort of circumstances maybe the sun as an actual star could also be a, a, a relatively uh, special uh, case so i think the the, uh, in the earlier i talked about the anthropic principle so if we think about advanced species like us the actual anthropic <coughs> principle is much stronger and therefore this balance between the cosmological principle and the anthropic principle is much more towards rareness so you know and, and, and if it means that only one in a hundred million stars uh, have a planet like Earth with, an, with, with advanced species, distances become so large that you can build your radio te telescope as big as you want, but you will never actually see it. So there is, an, yeah, I, do, I don't really believe in, in, in SETI to be a good way to, to, to search for life. It, uh, maybe you, have to, you can measure this stuff for a thousand years and not, and not finding anything. What I, what I like to, uh, to uh, you, can, you can become rich by working very hard, or you can become rich, you know, you know I don't want to work hard, so I'm going to buy a lottery ticket and just hope that, it, that, that, that I'm becoming rich. That, that is a little bit between SETI and between the, the, the type, type of work that I talked about. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm pretty optimistic that the climate change will be, um, in a positive way, Change, but what do you think? In, in, if we can learn maybe from other galaxies and life in those galaxies to help the climate change in the positive way on Earth, or don't you think so? Um, well, climate change is of course a very important uh, aspect. We we have one example where climate change goes uh, horribly wrong, and that is Venus. So uh, Venus has a, a what we call a, a runaway green, greenhouse effect. Um, the amount of CO2 is like 99% per, per percent of the whole atmosphere. So the, the greenhouse effect is, is orders of magnitude larger, and that's why it's 500 Celsius on the, on the actual surface. Um, I think the, um, the issues with uh, global warming are... Now, the Earth doesn't actually care about global warming, whether it's 2 degrees, 5 degrees. Do you really care that the, the Earth cares? No, we care. And that's because we are with 8 billion people. Um, very soon, they cannot live in large parts of the world. So where do they? they could, they're going to migrate, and they already, they already do that. And it's not that you can put your finger on it like, oh, and now these people move because of climate change. No, no, what happens when the resources go down, the war starts, and, 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 and that's the reason why, why, why people migrate. And maybe that, that is actually already happening, right? You see that in all sort of countries where, where, where wars start, and, uh, you know, and, and so I think that would be, uh, we always talk about the, the, the sea level rising, Right, yeah, we can build, uh, I think here, especially here, here in Holland, we can build dikes and things like that. But I think, you know, the global problems that, that, that uh, uh, global warming is going to give us, uh, uh, we, we cannot shut that actually out. This, this is going to be an enormous problem. And I'm uh, 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 very skeptical that we can, we can, we can deal with, with this. So you're not optimistic? 
not at all. No. <laughs> I'm sorry to uh, to bring you down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe that can bring me then to, to the final question and to blend in a bit with the previous a question. Positive. Oh no. That's a <laughs> <laughs> I think in astronomical research, you also push the boundaries concerning new technology, new advancements in technology. Do you also see, in a way, how all this new technology then? Uh, instead of looking at the skies, also can go back to, to Earth and also help us? Um, I'm afraid it goes the other way around. <laughs> oh, uh. um, the technology is often used already long before we actually use it, and that's hmm. because uh, uh, spy sat sat satellites uh, look actually down. So, for example, when the Hubble Space Telescope was, uh, was built, uh, uh, that that's actually... Uh, a copy of an actual spy uh, set satellite. So uh, <laughs> NASA already had a few of those looking looking down, and then uh, some people realized, oh, that's maybe also nice to look to look at. <laughs> so, uh, okay, <laughs> that's a quite an eye opener, to be honest. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So and yeah. and that's uh, and that's for some of the uh, actually for us that's very helpful hmm. because that's a reason why we can use it. If we would have to design ourselves or de develop ourselves everything that we are using it would cost so much hmm. money that nobody would know this is too expensive but because militaries and, and other agencies are using it or uh, are making it for other reasons then uh, we can actually lift with them and, and, and use it for our for our purposes yeah. okay also not uh, not a very positive message but mm. uh, <laughs> 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 yeah okay uh, thank you so much uh, Ignace. can we have an uh, Applause. <laughs> <laughs>